So I kicked off um, this month's three-day fast today. Uh, I guess last night I had my last dinner. And um, I was thinking about this on my workout this morning that I've never really kind of explained some of the tricks I use around how to speed up some of the benefits of fasting. And I consider the day one workout to be a very important one. So if any of you have listened to my podcast with Eileen White, which uh, is the podcasting where we go really, really deep on autophagy, which is obviously one of the main benefits of periodic fasting. You may recall that we talk about nutrient sensing being a very important trigger for autophagy. And one of those is obviously glucose. So um, I think in that podcast, but if not in that podcast, certainly in other podcasts, I've discussed the importance of glycogen depletion. So what is glycogen? Again, it's the storage form of glucose. So glucose is a very simple monomer. It's a six carbon ring. And if you want to store glucose, you have to you know, aggregate it and join it to a whole bunch of other glucoses. And basically glucose is stored in this glycogen form in two places. It's stored in muscle and it's stored in the liver. And they behave differently in those two places. So in the liver, glycogen stays stuck in the liver for reasons I don't want to get into now. But basically there's a, an enzyme that's missing that would prevent the final stage in allowing the glycogen to be turned into a glucose form that can escape. And so the benefit of that from an evolutionary perspective is that at least the muscle always has its own store of glucose that it never has to share with anyone else. Conversely, the liver, which itself metabolically is not the most demanding organ on the planet, it uses its glucose primarily to buffer the glucose level of the body. And this is actually, I think, probably one of the most underappreciated, amazing features of the liver is its capacity to buffer glucose levels within effectively a very normal and narrow range. So to put this in context, somebody my size walking around with a blood sugar of 100 milligrams per deciliter has a whopping five grams of glucose or about one teaspoon of glucose in their bloodstream. And you know, somebody who's got uh, the most advanced case of type two diabetes might walk around with only two to three times that amount of blood, so call it, uh, pardon me, glucose in their bloodstream. So say 10, maybe 15 um, uh, grams of glucose. Uh, at the low end of that spectrum, virtually unheard of to walk around below 50 milligrams per deciliter, which would be about two and a half grams. So the liver is constantly sending out little bits of glucose from its own reservoir of glycogen. But then you realize, well, the liver can only store so much glycogen. In fact, the liver can store you know, maybe 60, 80, at most 100 grams of glycogen at any point in time. The muscles can do about three or four times that amount. So <clears throat> how is it that we can fast for three days and yet maintain a blood glucose of 60 or 70 milligrams per deciliter? Uh, and more importantly, how do we not die? How does our brain manage to survive? Because of course, the demand of glucose by our brain is the predominant issue that our liver is trying to regulate. And how does this all tie into what I'm talking about with respect to exercise? So what I'm trying to do on the first day of exercise is deplete my glycogen as much as possible, both from my liver and also from my muscles, because that's what basically speeds up the process that I want to draw for you on this whiteboard. And I know what you're thinking, how goofy is it that you have a whiteboard to do this? And the reason is, I just think it's a lot easier to see this stuff than to sort of listen to me ramble. So I've represented my brain, liver, fat cell, and muscle, because those are basically the dominant players on this stage, if you will. You'll recall that the muscle has its own storage of glycogen. So let's just say it's got a few hundred grams of glucose. In a moment, I'll talk about the workout that I did, but the purpose of that workout was to lower that as much as possible. So let's say I've lowered that to probably 150 grams. Now my liver, let's say it started out at about 100 grams. I very quickly lowered that to probably about 50 grams. And the reason for that is most of that glucose came out to make its way to keep my brain happy. Now, what I'm trying to do when I fast is as quickly as possible, turn on a process where 
my fat cells start releasing fat and then that fat gets converted into a product called a ketone. But to understand why that's relevant, you have to actually sort of picture what that looks like. That fat that comes out as fat is really something called a triglyceride. So it has three carbons on a backbone and then these long chains. And it's actually these chains that are being converted into ketones. And when they are, this little guy called glycerol, the backbone, makes its way back to the liver and through a process of gluconeogenesis gets turned into glucose and therefore glycogen. And you see, without that, we'd all be dead. Because if we weren't able to keep enough glucose in our liver to keep our brain with a constant supply of it, no amount of ketones being produced also by our liver would keep this thing alive. So the workout that I'm trying to do is to, as quickly as possible, speed this whole thing up. And the way to do that is to drop these glycogen levels because that kicks off this whole cascade of signaling events that are discussed in that podcast with Eileen White. Okay, so what's the workout that I do? Now, today's a Wednesday. Normally Wednesday for me is a day that I'm gonna do strength training. But because it's day one of the fast, all rules out the window. Instead, it was an all out assault on this. So for me, the bike is the easiest way to get rid of glycogen. Some of you may be runners, some of you may be swimmers, rowers, whatever the case is. I find that the following level of intensity is best. It's a one-to-one -one ratio of work to recovery. And that sounds like a lot. That means, you know, in my case, it's about four minutes on, four minutes off. Um, but that allows me to work really, really hard during the on phase. So it is maximally glycolytic. And you might say, well, Peter, why four minutes versus one minute? Uh, it, it primarily comes down to energy systems. But for me, four minutes is basically VO2 max. It's slightly above VO2 max. And therefore, um, I just know that, that is, that's a highly glycolytic pathway for me. Uh, for others, it might be shorter. I just find that when you go too much shorter than that, it becomes too much of a neuromuscular activity and you fatigue too quickly. Um, so today what my exercise was is there's a hill near my house. That hill takes about four minutes to go up when you're moving at about 140% of your functional threshold power, which is just cycling speak to say you're working really, really hard. And it was basically up, down, up, down, up, down for an hour. Um, if I had more time, I would have done it for two hours, uh, but I was short on time today. And one hour is probably sufficient. And during that period of time, my blood glucose went from about 80 to 120, not uh, surprising. And now it's back in the, uh, I think it's when I last checked, uh, I, I think it was a high 70s, low 80s. Um, and I'll probably experience some more fluctuations of glucose today before tomorrow evening when it really starts to bottom out, uh, probably in the 70s. So again, in summary, I use this first day to do whatever I can muster, both volume and intensity wise, to maximize that uh, facilitation of get rid of, getting rid of as much glucose as I can here, getting rid of as much here, kicking off the signaling cascade that gets autophagy firing, because that's the reason I'm doing this. Uh, I'm certainly not doing this fast to make my skin look any better. Um, Tomorrow and the following day, I will not attempt to do those types of workouts. They would be utterly miserable. Instead, I will be lifting weights for reasons that perhaps I will discuss then. So hopefully this little primer on biochemistry uh, makes it a little bit more clear as to where the energy stores are coming from as we're fasting.